everybody. You're listening to Chatting with Candice. I'm your host, Candice Horback. Before we get started on this week's episode, if you have the time, please rate and review the podcast. It would help us out a ton. This week, I'm really excited. We have Candace Mama joining us. She was named one of the world's most inspiring women by Vogue magazine. She was also named the top 20 African women by African Union and the United Nations. Her story was turned into a documentary called It's a Pleasure to Meet You, which was featured at the Louis Vuitton Foundation. Candace Mama's story has been heard by the Dalai Lama. She's a published author, a multi-award winning speaker, a TEDx speaker, you can learn more about Candace at CandiceMama.com. I don't want to give too much of her story away. She does a much better job at telling the story than I ever could. So I'm going to let her get into that in just a second. If you want to find out more about Candace, you can go to CandiceMama.com. She's a really powerful woman. She's doing a lot of work in the field of forgiveness and healing. And I think that this is a really powerful episode for really anybody. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. It was such a pleasure to have her on this episode. Uh, my name is Candice Lama. Um, I'm in South Africa at the moment, but my work is forgiveness. It's forgiveness based. And so um, I'm called a forgiveness advocate, which I'm sure people have no idea what that means. Um, and that is basically I travel the world and I share my story and I inspire and help people to get over resentment, pain and trauma. So how did you get started as a forgiveness advocate? Like you have a pretty amazing story and for our listeners, usually like we don't do like a storytelling kind of format. It's more conversational. But as I was saying earlier, when like we were first getting started, like your story to me is just so powerful. And I feel like we would be like robbing the listeners of that value if we didn't allow you to do that. So if you would kind of get into your story and like what led you to where you are today. Absolutely. So um, I'm South African, as I mentioned, and I don't know how much people know about South Africa, but we're only 26 years into democracy. So prior to the 26 years, we lived in apartheid, which was basically segregation of black people. Um, And in the system, uh, when I was nine months, my father unfortunately was brutally murdered by an apartheid assassin by the name of Eugene de Kock. And when I was around the age of nine, my mom had bought this book. It was called Into the Heart of Darkness by Jock Poe. And on the cover was a picture of the person who had killed my father. And inside I knew was a picture of my father. But every time my mom would send me to get this book and she'd say, you're not allowed to look at it, you know, and send me out the room. And my curiosity started getting the better of me because people would like cry and scream. And I thought, what is it in this book? You know, like I know it's my dad, but what could he be doing that's making people react this way? So one day I sat outside the door and I overheard the number. And so I quickly scribbled down that number and I was so excited. And I thought, okay, when I get a moment alone, I'm going to see what's in here. And so eventually a day came when my mom left the house and I ran. I was so excited. I grabbed this book. I sat at the edge of the bed. And when I opened it, it was a picture of my dad's burned body clutching a steering wheel and his eyes were protruding. And so from that moment on, I just felt myself just start to change. I was so angry. I was so sad. And I couldn't tell my mom what I'd done. And so I started to go from this very happy child to this incredibly depressed and sad child. By the time I was around 16, I went to bed one night. I was an athlete, so I was fairly healthy. But this evening I couldn't get dressed and I was thinking, what is going on? Then I got this sharp pain in my chest. And so I went to my mom's room and I said, I think I'm having a heart attack. And so she looked at me and she rushed me to the hospital and the hospital kept me for observation. I went, these underwent all these tests and in the following day the doctor said I need to sit you guys down and so my mom was like of course and he said I don't know how to tell you this but your body's killing you and if you don't change whatever it is you're doing you're going to die and he said in my over 20 years of experience I've never seen stress symptoms so severe in someone your age And so we left the hospital. My mom refused to put me on tablets because she was like, I work in medical aid. You're not getting onto these tablets. You'll be dependent for the rest of your life. However, one day I was just like, I was around 16 going on to 17. And a thought occurred to me and it said, you know, you let Eugene kill your dad and now you're letting him kill you too. And that was one of the most defining points of my life. So I started just on this vengeance thing of like, I need to release this. I need to let it go. 
not so much for holy practice or anything. It was just to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, and then fast forward, eventually I get to 23 and I'm like, yay, I've made it. Um, and my, I get home and my mom says, I got a call from the MPA, which is the National Prosecuting Authorities. And they want to know if you'd like to meet Eugene, who was the man who had killed my father. And immediately I said, yes, but we started just going through these family discussions about, are we going, aren't we going? Eventually we ended up going. And so my mom asked, you know, what happened to my husband? And Eugene said to my mom, an ambush was actually set up for my father and three other gentlemen. And my father was an incredibly skilled driver. So when he was driving into Nelspreit, which is about an hour away from where we were living, um, Eugene's team was waiting for him and they fired on the car. And when Eugene saw that the car wasn't coming to a stop, he ran down the bridge and he emptied out his magazine cartridge on my father. When he still saw signs of life in the car, he doused them all in fuel and he set them alight. And so that was the first time we came to know what had really happened to my father. And so the conversation continued. My mom said, you know, I forgive you, Eugene. Then my older brother said, I forgive you. And my grandfather said, and my younger brother. Then it got to me and I said, you know, Eugene, I want to say I forgive you, but before I do, I'm going to ask you one thing. And he said, anything, what's that? And I said, do you forgive yourself? And for the first time, it's like he lost balance and he looked away and he dabbed the side of his eye and he looked back at me and he said, when you've done the things I've done, how do you forgive yourself? And I just began to sob and I started crying. And for the first time, I just felt it wasn't me being a victim to Eugene. It was just two victims sitting in the same room. And so they dismissed the meeting, the MPA members. And I got up first and I went to Eugene and I said, Eugene, would you mind if I gave you a hug? And he looked at me confused and he got up and he embraced me and he said, I'm so sorry for what I've done. And your father would have been so proud of the woman you've become. And then we went our separate ways. I advocated for his parole, which he later got. And yeah, so that's pretty much the story. I mean, that is just it's going to sound unbelievable to so many people because the idea of forgiveness, even when it comes to like very small transgressions is very difficult for people to actually like truly get there. Um, I always say, and it was, it seems to be similar with you is that when you reach this true forgiveness, like this level, like real authentic forgiveness, like you don't have a visceral response anymore. So like, It's like if you bring up, you know, like let's say a partner cheats or you, um, you know, someone stole something from you, whatever it is, and you feel like that tightening in your chest or your stomach drops or you maybe like start to feel like that rage bubbling up, then like clearly there's like a lot of things that are unaddressed that you still have to kind of face to actually get to forgiveness. And I think it was, um, you were saying like not having the emotional response. So there was this interesting book I read a few years back and it was called um, The Body Keeps Score. I don't know if you read that. Um, I can't remember the author, but it was the idea that um, these traumas can actually manifest physically in your body. Um, And part of it was like going through like epigenetics and saying that that can even like be um, like linear, like passed on from mom to daughter to granddaughter and so on. So it sounds like you were having like this very real stored trauma that was showing up physically. Um, I guess like what are some exercises that you would like recommend to people that maybe have like chronic illness or what some people would say is like disease that's caused from like these physical traumas or like, I guess, lack of um, like forgiveness? Yeah, you're so right. It is, it's a dis-ease, right? Like your body is not in an ease. Um, Mm -hmm. And for me, it is so important that you go through all the processes of healing, which is first you have to acknowledge your pain. Um, And for so many people, they, you know, struggle to acknowledge the fact that when my dad left, you know, and I was three, it really wounded me. Or when that person cheated on me or whatever the scenario is for individuals. And it's so important to acknowledge that that person hurt you. You are in pain. Mm -hmm. And then allow those emotions to occur. Sit through the pain, sit through the anger, sit through those emotions. Because I think so many times when we speak forgiveness, people want to go from trauma to forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it doesn't work that way, you know, because that's all just putting a Band-Aid over a bruise. And it's just going to keep, you know, the pus will come up eventually. And so you've got to sit with that pain. You've got to release it. Cry if you have to cry. Scream if you have to scream, but release it. The key to that, though, is give yourself a limit. So give yourself space and room to say, I'm going to feel this way for the next week. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to move on. 
And I'd even say maybe like an hour a day, designate time to it instead of saying the whole day because you don't want to get into that fun. And then after you allow it, then you can release it. Then you can start saying, what did I get out of this? Because even in the worst traumas, I mean, Holocaust survivors were actually interviewed and I've got what book it was, but they actually said they were grateful. Some of them said they were grateful for what had happened to them Mm -hmm. because they came out happier and more grateful people. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, you know, you've got to go through the process and then forgiveness. And then the one part that I need to add here is once you forgive, it does not mean you need to reconcile because that's what people think. They're like, oh, but I forgave you. Let's be friends. I'm like, no, you forgave him, but you can let him go. Let that fish back in the ocean. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you recognize that you were in pain? Because you were saying like, you know, 16, you had this very real physical reaction. You were hospitalized. And then like in your early 20s, you were like, I got this. It seems fine. Like, I think I'm forgiven. So like, how did you recognize that that pain was still there? You know, Candice, it's kind of one of those things, right? You know, when you're wearing rose colored glasses, the thing is you think that everyone else sees life the same way. You you assume that You know, how you move through life is how everyone else moves through life. How you see life is how everyone else sees life. It's when you take it off that you're like, oh my goodness, is this how I should have been living? And so to be honest, when people say, you know, that person knows they're terrible, they know they're a bad person. Sometimes people actually don't know. They don't know how much trauma they're carrying. They're like, I got over it. And they, they think they got over it because they don't think about it or they don't address it or they sweep it under the rug. And the truth is, like you said a little earlier, when you really know you got over something, it's when that thing does and you can think about it, but it no longer has that emotional trigger. Because mm-hmm. anything that rules your emotions rules your life, right? Mm-hmm. That is that walks past you and they living their best life and you're like, oh my goodness, heart attack. You know, they're the ones in control. They have the power in that situation. So when you remove that emotional attachment, you take back the power. And so to me, I had to realize in that encounter with Eugene, Mm -hmm. That, you know, he was a human being and whether I want to hate him or not, there's nothing he can do to take away what he did. Right. Mm -hmm. And so was I going to continue in this anger and sadness or was I going to live a better life that my dad couldn't live, you know, so it it had to be a decision for me. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like as someone from the outside, because you can, I think it's a lot easier to see someone who's maybe like self-destructive um, when you're like, you know, once or twice removed, but when you're the person that's like in the thick of it, it's like a lot harder to recognize maybe like your shortcomings or maybe like where you need to like work on. Do you think it's possible as like an outsider to like influence someone to recognize those, um, like necessities for change or do they kind of have to find that themselves? Oh, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Because I think you are a conscious being, right? Um, Mm -hmm. However, that consciousness comes for you, whether Mm -hmm. you you believe in living in this moment right now or whatever it is. And you see people being destructive. Your natural instinct or nature is to say, I know what you should do to fix yourself. Just do Uh it. Um, And you want to. You want to fix. When you're empathic, you want to help people. You want to get in there. You want to solve their problems. You're like, I know. If you just follow my roadmap to life, you'll be so happy. Um, And unfortunately, we can't do that, right? We can only control ourselves. And I think it was the Mother Teresa quote that said, you know, when you try and change yourself, that's when you realize, you know, the difficulty of it makes you realize how difficult it is to change someone else. Mm -hmm. You realize you you can barely change your own issues. So you're like, oh no, oh no, if if you're not going to you know and I'm sure you've experienced this too right whether it was in relationships or family relationships there is always that thing that you want to do people to do better Mm -hmm. but you can't force them to do better no and it's like something that's blatantly obvious to you is never going to be seen by some people if they're not ready to kind of see it um and I think everyone has to kind of experience like a enough pain, right? So it's like wherever your personal breaking point is. And then that's like where some people are going to either like sink or swim. And it's like, okay, like I'm going to choose not to live here. So I need to make these changes in order to like have my best life and like be the happiest that I can be, or I'm just going to fall victim to like this victim ideology, um, which I feel like we see a lot of right now. And I think it's just like so it's so hard to like be a bystander because you see so many people that are almost like competing for who's hurt the most. And I guess like you kind of just have to sit back and like wait for them to kind of like wake up on their own, which is frustrating. 
Um, the pain Olympics, I call it. That what do you call it? The Pain Olympics. Like, <laughs> but my pain is this, mine is this, mine is this, mine is this. <laughs> yeah, so I guess like, so we just had um, a baby. So we have like this little nine month old and we're trying like, I feel like we see things um, like from a different perspective now. Like we have like these like parent glasses and we're like, okay, so how do we raise this little human to not kind of fall into like certain um, like groups, if you will, like, cause there are like, like the victim groups. And it's like what you said, like they're almost competing for like, who's hurting the most, who's got the most pain, the most trauma. So it's like, how do you, I guess like, how do you create like this sense of like individuality when like so much of like human nature is to want to conform and like be liked and be accepted? Um, so how do you, how do you remain like strong and individual in like today's society? Oh, it's tough. And especially with social media, right? Mm-hmm. I think social media creates this. We in a society of outrage, the, the most outrageous, like, outraged person gets the most likes and views mm-hmm. and comments. And so people are trying to be the quickest, the quickest to react to anything like, oh my gosh, you did this. I'm going to react the quickest. So people will know I'm a morally righteous human being or whatever it is. Right. It's one of those things that you have to kind of look at and say, I think with kids, especially, um, you know, when you have whole parents who are living authentically and they are constantly striving to understand themselves, I think it rubs off on you, right? Because mm-hmm. it's when our parents are incredibly wounded and they don't attend to their wounding that it affects us the worst, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it's not so much, and I see it all the time where in society, everyone, everything is super offensive to everyone. You know, you can't say anything without someone being offended. You can't right. do anything without someone being offended. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, especially when just the fact that you have that thought that how do I raise a better human being? I think you're already raising a better human being. Mm-hmm. Just like by having the intention. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So do you say that like spirituality played any role in like your um, path to like awareness and forgiveness or did you have like a different path? Yeah, for me, I think, you know, I, I can't truly say it was a spiritual thing. I'd love to be like, you know, I really wanted to get into heaven and I did it. Um, <laughs> but it really wasn't that. For me, it was a survival thing. Okay. I knew that if I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't survive. Mm-hmm. And I also thought to myself, Myself, you know, if I don't take back power, if I don't take back my life, you know, this is what it's going to be. And my dad passed away when he was 25. I'm now 29. Mm. And so when I changed the paradigm and I said, you know what, I'm living for both of us. I'm living, you know, the 25 he couldn't have, the 26, 27, and every year thereafter. And so for me, it wasn't so much spiritual. However, um, I think my spirituality does play a role now, you know, because I've always been someone who was deeply curious about everything. Mm-hmm. You know, my mom was very mystical in nature. So she was always curious about, like, I want to know more. What's the stars? What's numerology? What's this? So I grew up with a very open minded mother, which helped me, um, you know, seek. So I'm a seeker by nature. I want to know, like if someone says there's life out there, I'm like, let's go see. <laughs> someone's like I can tell you in the tea leaves what's going to happen I'm like girl tell me the tea leaves like I'm (laughs) curious I'm the same (laughs) way I love that like just tell me all of the things I want all of the secrets to the universe I'm like tell me but also don't be like an asshole about it like (laughs) tell me (laughs) but tell me but be constructive (laughs) no that's amazing so um, with, did, have you read the book Letting Go by David Hawkins? No, I haven't yet. I haven't. Okay, so it's really, really good. So um, he kind of had some points that like cross over with yours, which is to experience the emotion. And he kind of says like there's no bad emotion. Like all emotions are just part of like the human condition. Um, so like to experience them without judgment. And then you said this um, really interesting fact that was like, you, the tears are there for a reason and the oxytocin is released when you cry. And I had no, I never knew that. Um, and I thought that was so fascinating because like I was talking to my husband about it and I was like, it makes sense because like a lot of girls, like and women are like, I just need a good cry. And he's like, men never say that to each other, but like, you know that you need that release. So, um, in the book, he's explaining when you're experiencing these emotions, whether they're, you know, joy, happiness, or even like um, anything that's like sad, sadness, anger, whatever, experience it, but then let it go. Because if you hold on to it, depending on like the specific trauma, 
um, he gets a little bit mystical in saying that it creates like blockages in your chakras. And then that's where like, you know, you get a panic attack or you get, you know, like some kind of disease or disorder. It's because like there's literally a blockage in your state of flow. Um, so I just think that's like so powerful. I'm like, I wonder if she read that because it crossed yeah. over so much. It sounds it sounds very relatable because I can mm-hmm. actually picture that, of course, because I'm like all about the mysticism. But um, <laughs> but I can see how your energy does get blocked. But I think you know, even if people don't believe in anything mystical and they're atheists and they don't believe in chakras mm-hmm. and all of that, I think there's a physical blockage that you do feel when you're mm-hmm. in pain. There's mm-hmm. a physical like it's almost like you're walking in this veil or you're walking in this fog, right? Mm-hmm. When, you are in a place of just crippling pain. And I genuinely believe, like I'm not someone who thinks that we should shy away from hard emotions. I think we do our most growing in difficult times. Absolutely. Like I've never been happy and been like, I need to grow and progress right now. I mean, <laughs> you know, in the hardest times when I'm like, I need to get my shit together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I learn the most spiritual lessons. I learn the most about myself. I, you know, work harder in those moments. And of course, I love happiness and I love joy, but I always say to people, I'm grateful I was depressed. I'm grateful that I've been to the darkest points of my life, the darkest points of my soul. Because when I experience joy, I also experience the highest points of joy and the highest points of happiness. But I don't look at the two as, oh, you, the one is bad, the one is good. I look at it as seasons. I'm like, if the world can go through seasons and we've got spring, summer, autumn, and winter, human beings can go through seasons. Mm-hmm. It's where you, one season you're really thriving and some seasons you're not. And it's okay. It's the flow. If you're not in control of like your emotions and like kind of like reconstructing like your narrative and having like that internal locus of control versus like an external locus of control. So how would you kind of like, what does that mean to you first? Um, And then I guess like, what are some ways to kind of like shift that narrative and start looking more like inwardly versus like externally, especially when it comes to um, like whether you have trauma in your life or you're not where you want to be financially, um, whatever the case may be. I think everything comes down to story. I think everything comes down to the narrative you are constantly telling yourself. And that narrative comes in thoughts, right? People are like, I don't tell myself a story. All of us have a story. All of us tell ourselves consistently, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is who I am to my friends, my partner, whoever. And so for me, it's so important to understand that until you take a pen or what typewriter and you start editing your story and saying, oh, this was true for me once, but it no mm-hmm. longer is. Mm-hmm. And being for that, you know, I think sometimes people, and this is what I found in my work and that I found so interesting, is that sometimes the pain defines us. It defines us to such a degree and to such a point that people are almost scared to forgive because they don't know what's on the other side of that forgiveness. They don't know what it's like. They don't want to know. They don't want to explore the unknown. Mm -hmm. And so that's always fascinating to me that you get so married and you cling so tightly to being the victim of the story or, you know, being this because it's comfortable. People know you as that, you move through life as that, but all of a sudden, if you do this other thing, how do you move through life, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's so important to get very honest with yourself, brutally honest with yourself and say, what is benefiting me from the story? Because even the most painful stories, there's some sort of a benefit if you keep living in that pain and you keep Mm -hmm. living in that story. So you have to really get honest and say, you know, the sympathy from others, um, the fact that my mom does more for me now that I'm, you know, at home and this and this is happening. And when you get honest with yourself, then you can be like, do I actually want to change this? Mm -hmm. Because that's what something, you know, people actually ask themselves. They're like, yeah, but I'm unhappy or I'm uncomfortable. Yeah, you can be unhappy and uncomfortable for the rest of your life and be in the same situation. So you have to get honest. If you want to change it, then you have to re-script your life. You've got to say, okay, how do I get, how do I view this situation differently? Because it's through looking at the same situation through a different lens that gives you the power. You can either say, you know, I'm Candace and my, you know, my dad was brutally murdered or whatever the case is. Or you can be like, I'm Candace and, you know, I went on to do great things in spite of the fact that my dad was murdered. You know, so it's all about your own interpretation of an event that matters. Mm-hmm. 
So when it comes to healing, you were saying that it's not this linear process. And I think that's like so important to really drive home to anybody because a lot of people think like if you do the work, you're enlightened and that's it. So can you kind of describe like your what your graph looks like, I guess, for healing? And then a follow-up would be how to like make sure that you stay on that positive side and not kind of get sucked back in, especially if maybe you're in this space of being surrounded by maybe negative influences um, and you can, might not be in a position to like remove yourself necessarily. So protecting that. Yeah. I mean, you're right. I, the scale of um, healing that I always use is like, you're doing great, you're doing great, you're doing great. And it's like, you know, there's this squiggly line in the middle where everything just goes awry. Then you're like, okay, this is messy. This is terrible. I'm going back. <laughs> you know? and, and I think it's in that moment of saying I'm going back, but you've got to decide that I'm going to keep at it. Mm-hmm. Because I think sometimes because of the society we live in, you know, everything is a one, two step, like the three steps to forgiveness, the five steps to this, the, you know, 25 steps to this. And we enjoy that. We like knowing that, This part, okay, I'm going to feel like this. This part, I'm going to feel like this. However, with pain, anyone who's been through a breakup knows it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. You don't go and you're like, oh, you start off and you're like, I'm doing great. I don't need Jerry in my life. Fuck Jerry. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, like you see an Instagram post and you're like, oh my gosh, I could have been happy with Jerry. (laughs) (laughs) And then you're like, you're in this loop and now all of a sudden you think all your progress is gone because you saw this picture and it triggered you and, you know, you want to go back to square one. But I think it's so important to understand, give yourself a break, show yourself some compassion Mm -hmm. because that's what people lack. People lack self-compassion. And so when the things get hard, they're like, I'm so stupid. I'm never going to heal. Things, you know, always fall apart and they get into this negative cycle when instead you can be like, you know what? I saw Jerry with a new girl and it pissed me off and it made me miss him and it made it did this. And you just acknowledge it. Acknowledge mm-hmm. it. And then you can keep moving forward. But it's when you try and repress it or you try and deny it that you get into trouble. Because as soon as you come face to face with your trauma and pain in the healing process and you're like, I'm not going to think of that. I'm not going to face that. And you push it away. There's that famous quote that says, what you resist persists. Mm-hmm. So the more and push the more it comes at you and before you know it it explodes mm-hmm. instead of just saying, Oof, sit with it be like oh man that hurt oh that sucked mm-hmm. sit with it release it allow those emotions to come if it's sadness let it be sadness if it's longing let it be longing and then you move forward you're like okay i'm giving myself these this hour these two hours to feel but i'm going to keep moving forward tomorrow i'm going to wake up and it's going to be a new day and I'm going to continue on this journey. So I think that's what's important for people to realize that even when you are in the middle messy part, show yourself some self-compassion and don't believe that you've got to be happy because I think that's the biggest illusion people have that as I'm healing, I'm going to be happy and skipping through the hills when the truth is you're probably not going to be happy. You're mm-hmm. probably going to just soldiering through some days and some days you're just going to be getting by. But the fact that you're making those conscious leaps forward and you're doing your journaling, if that's what you're choosing to do, or you're doing your art, or you're doing your yoga, or you're doing whatever it is, an activity that gives you release, do it and mm-hmm. just keep moving forward, you know, and be patient with yourself. And I think for me, the last thing I'll say is stop having this big end goal. Like when I forgive, I'm going to be like, ah, no, just, just keep moving forward. You know, you'll know that you don't, you no longer feel that chest constraint and, you know, that visceral reaction when you get there, but don't rush there. Allow yourself to get there with self-compassion and ease. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's like, that's really, really beautiful advice. I think we have like this misconception that once you, once you forgive everything is just like rainbows and butterflies and you're just going to like live there forever. And even if it's like someone who's maybe still in your life. So I think it's important Um, like you said earlier, you can forgive someone and that doesn't necessarily mean that they still have to be part of your life. Like you can let them go if they're not beneficial for you. Um, so like those things aren't like mutually exclusive, but there are cases where you, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a child, maybe it's someone who's just not going to leave. Right. Or it would take a lot more, um, stressors for it to actually be like to that extent. So it's like also reminding yourself that you can forgive them for X, Y, and Z, but if they're not doing the work, like those things are going to probably continuously bubble up and then it's just going to have to be like a muscle that you're like continually like working on um, because there are going to be times where you take 10 steps backwards and you're like, I'm going to emotionally react in a way that I'm not proud of. And it goes back to just like 
awareness and recognizing that and like taking personal accountability, sitting with it, and then like apologizing if you need to apologize. And it goes back to like internal versus external viewpoints, right? So it's like, you can't say, I blew up because you said X, Y, and Z. Like, that's not true. I blew up because of my expectation of you. And then that was my fault. And then that's how I'm processing the information. And that's how I decided to respond. So you have to, at the end of the day, like take personal responsibility and like look internally. Otherwise you're just going to keep going back and back and back. And then you're going to live in this like victim circle that just like never ends. Oh, and that's powerful. I think everything you said is so powerful because, you know, you can't control another person, right? As much as we'd love mm-hmm. to do that, but you have to take the control you do have. You've got to take the moments that you can control and say, you know what? This is what I can control at this time. And like you're saying, it's so difficult if it's like a child who's in a parent's household, right? Then maybe their parents are narcissistic or abusive, whatever the case is. And situations like that are incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a very abusive home. So it was very difficult to, you know, try and be good while everything around you is so chaotic. But I think in moments like that, it's about reminding yourself that your environment is not your fault and you're going to get out of it. I think you have to like just, train your mind into that, you know, conversation that blocks you off from your environment as hard as it is until you can get out and be like, you know what, this person is doing what they're doing because they have their own traumas they haven't dealt with. They've got their own issues. I think personalizing is what hurts us Mm. because we're like, you know, my mom did this because I'm unlovable or my dad left because I wasn't worthy or, you know, my partner left because of ABC. And we internalize it because deep down it speaks to some wounding all of us have gotten, right? Then you're like, oh, it must be. It must be true that I'm unworthy. It must be true that I'm this. Whereas it's like, it's true that your dad was wounded. It's true that he wasn't capable of being a father. It's true that it's got nothing to do with you. So I think what you said is just powerful. You shouldn't personalize things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. um, It was probably like three years ago. We kind of went to this... um, like we call it brain camp and it's essentially like alpha brain training. So how to get into like a flow state Um, and the way that they introduce it to someone in like the very beginning, like entry level is like the easiest way to kind of get into that state is like through forgiveness work. Um, And at the time I was like at a very different spot in my life. I was like, this is all woo woo. This is garbage. I can't believe we're wasting our time here. Um, but nonetheless, like my ego kind of wouldn't let me quit. So I like went in and I did the work and they kind of have you make like a short list of people that you need to forgive. And like what you realize is like that list is like never ending. Like it's just, there's so many people that you like, you have, you know, emotional baggage connected to that you need to release. So for me, I was like, there's, you know, I, there's no way I'm going to ever be able to forgive like this certain person. Cause what they did was like, it was too bad. Like you don't know what I went through. Like it was extreme. It wasn't like normal abuse. Like it was like you, whatever you justify it. So when you're forced to kind of like forgive that person, cause that's like the goal, right? Is you kind of have to find the humanity in them and you have to like, they're not just the perpetrator, right? Like they're not just the bad guy in your story. Like they have their own story as well. So you have to kind of like say like, how did they get there? Because I don't think as much as I think some people are lost, I don't think the vast majority of people are born bad, right? Like they're not like, they're not born and just out hurting people. Like no one wants to be there. So like what pains did they have to endure to get to that place? And when you kind of like keep taking steps back and back and back and even to the point where maybe you have to do like inner child work with them and like put them in a space where they're vulnerable and they're being victimized and they're like this innocent little being. And then it's hard to have anything but like compassion and love for that person. And I think that's when you really have that moment of like transcendence. And then you reach that point where you have forgiveness without like that, you know, physical or emotional response. And I try to explain this to people that maybe like have like a toxic relationship and they can't forgive a partner for X, Y, and Z. And like, You just have to keep taking it back. And sometimes you can spend days, weeks, months, however long focusing on one person. But I guarantee if you step it back enough, like you will get to a point where you can look at that person and like have love for them, regardless of what transgression happened. I mean, you literally hugged your father's murderer. You know what I mean? Like 
I don't think anyone else can say that it's not possible when you're, when you have this story, right? Like that's like such a wrong, like that's such an evil. And like you were able to find love and compassion. Um, so I think it's very important to give everybody humanity. I think everyone deserves that regardless of the transgression. Otherwise we're never going to like move forward in life. Yeah. And it's so true. I think everything you've touched on is so important in the healing process in your own emotional journey. Mm -hmm. I think so many times what I've even found is, you know, it's interesting because there's a story um, where I was breaking up with a partner. I was already doing this work and I was breaking up and I sat him down and I said, look, you know, I'll, I'll use Jerry for now. Mm -hmm. um, look, Jerry, I don't think things are working out. You know, it's been fun, you know, but I wish you all the best, blah, blah, blah. And then he looked at me and he said, are you kidding me? And I thought, oh, he's so devastated. He's heartbroken, you know. Um, I mean, who wouldn't be? Of course he is. And then he goes, you're telling me you can forgive a mass murderer, but you cannot forgive me. <laughs> and, I was like, and I just found it so ironic because the truth is, at that time, forgiveness wasn't even featuring for Jerry at that time. You know? <laughs> Um, and so it is important to highlight that, yes, I teach this work, but I continue to go through challenges. I continue to have to, you know, humanize people. I continue having to practice my teachings. And mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not something that you can ever get through at the end of your life and say, yes, you know, I mastered it. But you can understand it enough to know that this is to empower myself. It's got nothing to do with this person. Because even our partners, even our most challenging partners, there's something in us that gets addicted to those qualities that may be toxic, right? There's mm -hmm. um, a wounding within us that hooks onto them. It's our wounding that locks onto the wounding. Then we become this wounded couple. Mm -hmm. And then their acting out becomes like, you know, a pillar of our, whether we, we very empathetic, empathetic and we want to prove our love through, you know, I will be there for you, Bonnie and Clyde style through thick and thin. And then their, you know, expression of that is, I'm going to leave whenever I want. I'm going to be abusive. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. But that their nature speaks to your nature of needing and chasing and wanting that approval from a difficult person, right? Whether your father was difficult, whether your mother was difficult, whichever it was, you're seeking that approval and you believe that, you know, if I can make them do this, they will be great. If I can show them this, they will be great. But when you address that wounding within yourself and you say, you know what, I need to forgive this person, yes, but I also need to forgive myself and I need to work on this wounding that is so magnetically drawn to this person that it refuses for me to let this person go. And it's like through that process of healing yourself, you almost heal the dynamic in a sense because you either get to choose to walk away and you know forgive from afar or you get to be within the union and if should this person, of course, no, not physical abuse or sexual or anything like that, but should they be, you know, just, distant or something like that you get to choose to say i'm gonna you know be present in the best way i can and should you not be able to meet me here unfortunately we've got to go our own ways you know so it is so important it's so important to understand that within ourselves that sometimes the hardest person to forgive is you is the person looking at you in the mirror every single day you know mm -hmm. and would you say like that lack of like personal understanding or like personal forgiveness is why like some people end up in those relationships yeah, you know i i hate to i'll never victim blame i don't blame anyone who's mm -hmm. in an abusive relationship or any toxic um, environment however what i have seen is the fact that we hook on i mean i'm no different in my past relationships i would hook on to someone because there was an addictive quality there was a mm -hmm. if i win you over it shows me i'm worthy mm -hmm. so there's a word issue there's a languaging issue that's going on in your mind and a programming that you're not addressing and you're not looking at that's saying okay if you if this person can love you and they're so difficult and they so this and they so that it means you're lovable because who else i mean you crack this terrible person or you you crack this hard person oh wow but the truth is it's like a dog chasing a car right mm -hmm. what are you going to do when you catch it it's just like oh shit do i have to look at myself now right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's, it's really, it's, it's interesting how much we, how far we're willing to go to escape ourselves. And I think it's a really sad thing to witness, you know, whether people turn to substances or they, you know, toxic relationship after toxic relationship off, because it fills that void. As long as there's noise in your environment, you don't need to deal with the noise within. 
But when there's peace in the environment and that noise is loud, you want to escape it, right? So really when you start showing yourself compassion, showing yourself kindness and forgiving yourself, that's when your patterns, programs and what you're attracted to begin to shift and change. I don't know if you've ever experienced this or... Yeah, I mean, so we, I grew up in a pretty like abusive situation and like my role models are exactly what you're describing. And I've always kind of been so curious as it's almost like a moth to a flame situation. And I do believe, and it goes back to a little bit of quantum physics and like a little bit of mysticism, but that like, like attracts like. So again, it's not like victim blaming, but there is something that's invisible that are you know, attracting these two people to another, you know, to one another. And it's like, it, there, I don't really believe in coincidences either. So I don't find it coincidental that one person, you know, maybe has 10 different partners throughout a lifetime and all of them are a, ref, a reflection of each other. So I think that there's like a lesson there that kind of like needs to be mastered probably on both ends. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think you can go anywhere until you have that like self, like self actual actualization moment. Um, and again, like looking inwardly, cause it's so easy when you're in like that kind of situation to like see the obvious pain points that are external. Um, and I think like the more that you have on the outside, the easier it is to kind of ignore yourself and like the inner work that you have to do. Um, what I'm curious about is, and if you want, we can like totally cut this out. Cause it's like, a little bit controversial, but when you see like groups of people that are hurting, right? And Eric and I, like my husband, we've talked about this at length just because of you can't escape it on social media, especially in like the US right now. So like there's almost like we've gone back a hundred years, at least from my viewpoint, in diversity and racial diversity. Um and it or like division, I should say, racial division. And it's instead of like coming together, right, to like progress, it's almost like you just see more people purposely pitting one another against each other. And if you believe in epigenetics, like slavery wasn't that long ago, right? And if you believe that trauma can get passed down from generation to generation, and then that can show up in a bunch of different ways, then it's very understandable that this group of people is hurting. And when you're hurting, you lash out and you know, sometimes like healthy ways and sometimes unhealthy ways. So I guess like as a community, I think it's like a little bit more abstract to tackle, but as a community and you see these people maybe lashing out in an unhealthy way, like how do you like acknowledge the pain and then also try to like be a support system to help them like grow out of it? Because personally, I don't think it's anything the government can fix. I don't think it's anyone on the outside can fix. I think like it's a has to go down to an individual level, right? And like we need to like fix ourselves, everybody across the board. Um, so I guess like if in your perfect world, how would you go about healing like what's going on right now? Yeah, I think you had a really interesting point about um, you know individual healing. I think it's not just America; it's around the world. I think you're seeing it playing out in different pockets, South Africa included whereby there's um, an undercurrent of just everyone feels like they're walking on eggshells. No one knows when, when the real eruption is going to happen, um, mm -hmm. when someone is going to say something outrageous that really fuels the fire, right? Um, and the one argument I always hold is that no human being who's self-fulfilled, self-actualized um, and healed is going to kneel on anyone's neck for, mm -hmm. you know, five minutes and not feel anything in, within. Mm -hmm. That person is already dead within themselves and they're already in so much pain that to them to carry out that act so deliberately and so, you know, haphazardly is a wounded human being. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it is important, like what you're saying, for people to individually heal. Because right now what it feels like is people are like talking past each other. Um, people are, you know, looking at society or the government or whatever this bigger thing is to fix things whereas yes there's a systematic issue that we all have to acknowledge and address which is you know systematic racism systems were built in this way we know this however when it comes to the individual issues holding on to anger to fight this issue for me does not i don't want to you know eradicate anyone's anger 
I think it's incredibly important. I also feel though that we need to heal so that when we are speaking and when we are out there and we are trying to get bills passed, we're speaking from a place of conviction and we healed within ourselves and not from a place of pain. Mm-hmm. Because what that to do is, I mean, if we take it away from politics and we bring it to a personal level, have you ever had a productive discussion when you were angry with your partner? Never. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? None of us Never. have. Because it's everything. The worst thing you're thinking at that moment is exactly what's going to come out. And sometimes you're not even saying things that you mean. Sometimes you're just <laughs> saying things to hurt this person, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes I feel like that's what society is doing. We're screaming so loud that we just want to get at each other mm-hmm. instead of being like, this isn't working. Mm-hmm. Me calling this and you calling me that, it doesn't work. It's just name calling. At mm-hmm. the end of it all, you're going to go to your corner. I'm going to go to my corner and that would have changed. So mm-hmm. I think you're right. I think there is such a strong um, need for people to heal right now. And I think for me, it's also very important. I'd say healing is one, but another thing is to have really respectful and open dialogues with each other. Yeah. I don't think it's fair when anyone tries to broach the subject um, of any sort of racial inequality or even sexism or whatever. If a man speaks on behalf of a woman and says, you know, I, I really hate the fact that the world is fair, like, you know, um, not equal or whatever. And then people are like, oh, fuck you. You know, like, we're like, what? I'm like, yeah. give us allies. I'm like, I'm a woman. Let him speak. You know, Absolutely. If, males, if more males that have voting power and are changing legislature are going to listen to him and pass okay. that ball, I don't give a damn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, whoever needs to speak, if he needs to speak, let him speak. And mm-hmm. I think that's where the problem I'm finding is. People mm-hmm. are just, people are so obsessed with the idea that, oh, I want to do it for myself and I want my, con-. that it's like, but we need help, right? Mm-hmm. Because the way it's been working hasn't been working. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's so important. I think both of what you said, I think one, we need to have conversations with each other that are respectful. And two, I think people need to heal. If anything, COVID has shown us how many people are in pain and are carrying this resentment and trauma and People want to hurt people, you know, whether that's through their words on social media and troll. I mean, you have a huge following. I'm pretty sure that people, you know, sometimes just pick at you for no reason. They just come oh, yeah. on your page. They follow you to pick on you and you're Daily. like, what the fuck? <laughs> just go off my page. <laughs> <laughs> go do something go, else. Go eat a sandwich, whatever. Like just, you know, go, like, you know, whatever. But people want to hurt other people. And I think that needs to change. Mm-hmm. So I feel like hurt people hurt people, right? Like it's just, it's cyclical. Um, And we kind of already unfortunately went over the point that you can't change anybody, right? Like that's like something you have to do inwardly. So I guess like how do you maybe place like seeds of influence or um, I guess like interact with these people. So for me, when it comes like we can use like the social media trolls as an example. Um, I like it depends on my day, it depends on my mood and where I'm at. Like whether I just like ignore it, delete it, engage with it in like a humorous fashion, or I actually try to like justify myself to this complete stranger, right? Which is like that makes zero sense. So I guess like. From the, from like my position, like what would you recommend that I do to like help that person and I guess like have more of like an empathetic approach rather than like me trying to defend myself or me trying to like, I guess like, you know, um, banter back and forth. Like what's like a productive discord there? Yeah, I think for you, it's incredibly difficult. And I say this because I think people look at it and they're like, well, I have the right to say whatever I want to say, right? For any public figure, not even, you know, industry-based or whatever, when you have a big following, you attract as many, you know, bees as you do flies. Like, it just is that way. For me, I think, though, it's so difficult because if someone is there to literally just get get a rise out of you, Mm -hmm. any response you give them is a good response, right? Because, Because you're the one here, and they hear, they are known. You, you have a reputation. You've built your life. You've built your brand. You've, you've done all of this. You got to the place you are in life. And so anything else is like a little dog barking at a lion, right? Like it's like, Burr! and when the lion gives the little dog attention, then it's like, oh, yay, look at me. You know, I got the response, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. And so, so I, I think the best way, at least for me, if I was looking at it from the outside looking in, I'd say, you know, the way you are is perfect. Like, I think it's just, 
you know, the content you're putting out. You're trying to open people's minds. You're trying to expand, you know, how people think and view life and you're having important dialogues and you're sharing important stuff. And I think it's to continue doing that. I think as far as engagement goes, you know, people who are there to pick on you and try and bully you and whatever the case is, those people aren't looking to be healed or, you know, aren't looking to, they just want the reaction. They just want you to respond. And whether you respond in an angry way, humorous way, or whatever way, they just like, she responded to me. I'm important. I mean, people even celebrate the fact that people block them. I'm like, are you like, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, look who blocked me. And I'm uh-huh. like, oh, yeah, I've seen it. that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I don't know. I just, I think for you, I mean, the fact that we are having this conversation, the fact that you've engaged with other people on your podcast to have a different way of thinking while trying to educate the world in alternative healing or thinking or belief systems, that's important. And using your platform and understanding you have a platform to do that is important. As far as commenting goes, I don't think, I don't think. Just don't engage. (laughs) I'm like, don't engage. Don't engage with that person. Yeah, I think that's probably wise. I need to like really just tell myself, I need to like put a post-it somewhere that I see it when I'm like going through everything. It's so difficult because I'm human. Uh, I spoke to, um, I've got a podcast called Coffee with Candice, ironic, but but anyway, (laughs) I love to talk. Um, So, (laughs) and I'd love to have you on it at some point, but I spoke to um, her name is Evie Pompurus. I think she's someone you might want to speak to too. Um, she was the secret, she's a uh, former secret service agent and she protected Barack Obama, Michelle Obama. She's a judge on spy games and all these other things. But basically now what she does is she teaches people, you know, body language and all these kind of things and self-protection and confidence and stuff. And so basically she said something in our interview that I just thought, oh, that's amazing. And she said, just because someone throws you the ball doesn't mean you have to catch it. Mm. Like you can just let it go. She's like in an argument in life, in anything you choose, you give it life when you engage with it, mm-hmm. but you can let the ball bounce off and you keep going about your way. And it actually sometimes has a bigger reaction on that person than engaging with it. You mm-hmm. know? So I was like, Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, that is really interesting. Cause you don't think what was, we were watching something, Um, and they're like, just because you have a tool doesn't mean you need to use it. It's like the same case. And you're like, oh, of course. And it's like so obvious when you say it out loud, but, um, but it's harder when you're human. uh Uh-huh. Totally. (laughs) Right. You want to react emotionally. I feel like that I, that's something that I like constantly try to like improve with myself is I like, I am the type of person, like, I would bleed dry for, like, all of the world's problems. Like, I get, like, so invested. If you, like, tell me this story, I'm going to, like, feel it with you. I'm going to want to fight the wrong with you. And then there's, like, a whole, like, you know, another issue over here. And then I go over there. So it's, like, trying to, like, not emotionally react all the time, like, being able to focus energy on one specific thing. And then hopefully that one thing kind of helps trickle down effect instead of just, like, ADD here, 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 here. And then you said something wrong. So now I have to like, you know, step in. So I think it's being able to like realize like you're not your emotions and like let that play out, take a step back. Cause a lot of the times when you have like a knee jerk reaction to like anything, it's probably not going to wind up so good for you, even if you have like the best intentions. Um, I've caught myself in a couple of holes. Like, you know, I think it's also important for you to give yourself a break and realize that even with monks, they have to separate themselves from humanity to become Mm. like, you know, spiritually enlightened and protected or whatever. Mm. So, I mean, you know, it's the difficulties within the interactions with humanity, right? Mm. I mean, Buddha like under the tree is incredible. Like when he comes off, like, and he has to interact with humanity, it's like, Oh, human beings. Mm. (laughs) I think, I think being a human being is, you know, understanding that it's okay to be triggered. Because you do feel just the same way as you feel so beautifully for people's causes and you feel their pain. It's the same way you feel, you know, inside and you're like, whoa, like, I'm a good person. I'm trying to do good for the world. And she's a good person. And that person's a good person. Like, no, we need to change this, you know. And so it's hard to not internalize. But I think it is important to almost validate yourself and give yourself more compassion than all the other people around you who don't see it or who don't value it. At least Mm -hmm. I think. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Oh, that's interesting. So Eric just wrote something on the board. Um, so he wanted to ask, um, I guess like when it comes to like the need of like belonging and like we, and again, we see it so much right now in like the sense of like tribalism. So how do you, how do you not, I guess, like fall victim to that? Because I feel like once we start like labeling things and like identifying like such specific ways, it just, again, creates like so much division. And like, this is a time where we're supposed to be like kind of coming together and not like separating ourselves. So how do you, I guess, get that strength to not want to like just go into like your tribe and like people that kind of are influencing your train of thought, which maybe is not self-serving in a positive way. Mm, and it's difficult because I think as we animals, right, human beings instinctively are animals and we pack animals at that. Um, I mean, back in the day, you know, if you were in your tribe and you got separated, the likelihoods of your survival were very slim. And mm-hmm. um, so I think that has just changed in the way we operate now. We need that validation from social media or from people who look like us or sound like us or have opinions like us. Um, I think for me, though, it is so incredibly important to understand that it's within communities that are different to you that you learn the most. And always be willing to question. I think that's what people don't do enough of. Just because you hear something does not make it fact, right? Just because you think something doesn't make it fact. Yes. And so it's so important to be with people who are different to you, who can challenge that thinking, who can challenge that belief system. Because if you and all your friends every weekend believe in the same thing and you do the same thing and all of you guys have the same results, it's like, of course that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. But when you talk to a friend that looks like this or that does that or in different industries and in different places, all of a sudden you're like, hmm, you know, I, I'm actually learning a lot from these people. I'm learning because now you're becoming a better rounded human being. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, it's so important not to fall into the dynamics of, mm-hmm. you know, I am a black female, so therefore I can only, you know, group with black females. But instead using the fact that I get to operate in different spaces and say, look, you know, we get along, we're having a great conversation. Why can't you do that with other people that have like me? Or, you know, LGBTQ plus community. I mean, I'm not a part of the community, but I will gladly speak up for the community and be like, look, you know, like they should have the right to be as miserable as the rest of us. If they want to get married, and get married you know? mm-hmm. so it's so important to understand that, first of all, that you have to be willing to have an open mind and question your beliefs. And I think that's where everything stems from. If you're willing to question what you believe, then you, you're less likely to become cliquish or like tribalistic or move into your little corner and sign off the world. Because truth is, that's where it's comfortable. But mm-hmm. you, we don't grow in comfort. We grow when we are in different spaces and arenas, right? So I think for me, that's probably the one thing I'd say. But to joke, also like you can't pull people out of their comfort zone because they resist, right? Anything that feels forced, people resist. But when you show through your actions that I'm doing this, I'm going out there, I'm speaking to this person, I'm speaking to, you know, a Democrat, a Republican or whatever, Mm -hmm. and we can still have lunch together. It's Mm -hmm. not a big deal. You know, then it shows other people that, oh, well, if she could do it, then it's not going to kill me to do it. You know, I don't know. What's your point of view on it? So I, I totally agree. I think that you need to have exposure to as many different ideas, ideals, people, um, theologies as possible. If you like have one train of thought and you're just like looking for information that's like reinforcing that, you're not actually learning anything. Um, and then if someone like actually goes as far to question you and says like, why? And then you're like, oh, well, that's because it's, I feel this way. And you can't, using your emotions to validate any, you know, thought like that's, that's not accurate, right? You need facts behind whatever it is. So for me, another thing that Eric and I are like focusing right now is like education. And I don't know what it's like where you're at in South Africa, but in the States, it's the exposure for like diversity of thinking is gone when it comes to universities and even just really grade school. Like it's everybody's on one side and they're pitching kind of one narrative. And the idea, there's this book called The Coddling of the American Mind. And it's saying how we have kind of created these kids and young people that now think thoughts are dangerous or differing belief systems are dangerous. Instead of saying, no, like this is how you get stronger, right? This is how you get resilient is by like someone challenging your beliefs. And maybe at the end of the day, you leave and you are exactly where you started, but now you know why, right? So 
for me, I'm like, how do we get back to a point where we like think it's fun to have a conversation with someone who sees the world differently? Because it is, right? How boring would it be if everything was the same and everyone thought the same thing? Like, you need challenges and you need someone like a sparring partner, if you will, and in good fun, like not obviously to like try to degrade someone or whatever, but it's, you know, debating can be fun and like discussing different ideologies can be fun. How do we kind of get back to a place where we see it that way instead of like, Ooh, we can't talk about that because the common understanding is X. Mm. But I think you saw, you know, you saw on the mark there, I think, it's more coming back to one word for me. And that word is respect. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we've lost in today's society. I think with social media and everything and having such easy access to almost everyone, right? Mm -hmm. You, people have lost the element of this is a human being, (laughs) you know, this person has feelings. If someone said this to me, you know, it's almost like taking it back to like what you learned in the playground. Yeah. If someone said this to you, how would you feel? Um, And I think now because we live in a society where you can tweet something completely outrageous, disrespectful, rude, and have 20,000 other people retweeting that same nonsense, and no one's stopping and saying, whoa, do we have all the facts? Oh, is that her choice or his choice or whatever choice, you know? And for me, I think the day we lost the respect for one another is the day everything kind of started to go backwards, you know, Mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, we need to be completely PC about this and that and this and that because now it's like we have to police people's language because there's no faith that people will actually use their language efficiently and respectfully, right? So Mm -hmm. it's it's such an interesting place and time, I think, for the world to be in. I think it's it it goes back to what you said earlier, which is like what you resist, you persist. So it's like by these people kind of create like what by the narrative of like PC and like um, like policing language, like by forcing that and especially like through campus policies specifically, um, you're kind of creating more of a harsh reaction on the other side. And they're like, well, no, like you can't police what I say because of the constitution, blah, blah, blah. So then these, instead of saying like just having a regular discourse, like they're like, purposely saying outrageous things to like prove a point. So it kind of like backfired in a way. So it's like, you have to kind of just trust people at the end of the day. Like you have to like give them that freedom, trust that they're going to do the right thing. And then I think it also goes back to like, people are going to hurt your feelings and that sucks. Like, obviously like one of the things I say all the time is like, just like, don't be a dick like that. Like if I could give any advice, it's just like, don't be a dick. Like let people do whatever they want. You can disagree with it. What, as long as you're not physically hurting anybody, you don't have to engage with them. If they're a mean person, don't engage. But as long as like that's like your mentality, I think everyone would get along just fine. Um, but I think we have this idea that like we're supposed to be protected from language and we're supposed to be protected from um, people hurting our feelings and everyone has to agree with us and everything has to like, you know, have padding around it. You're not going to become resilient that way. You're actually going to like become weaker that way because it's like that whole like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? But for some reason, like we forgot like that very ancient bit of wisdom. Um, so somehow we have to kind of like get back there, get our influencers back there, get our you know, teachers back there, like everything. Um, I don't know. It's a lot easier said than done, right? Oh, absolutely. But I think your motto is pretty much what I also say. It's like, a, you know, don't be a dick. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> Don't be a dick to others. Don't be a dick to yourself. Like that's, that's really, if there's nothing else you ever listen to, that should be your only guiding principle. (laughs) (laughs) So I agree. I think, you know, it is important for us to, whether we implement systems whereby, you know, things that are incredibly racist or incredibly sexist or incredibly whatever. um, And when I say this, I mean, like it has to be a spectrum, a very measurable spectrum of what qualifies as this. Um, I think we can, you know, say, okay, we know for sure you're going out and, you know, wearing like a KKK, you know, or like a swastika or whatever it is that represents racist ideology. Mm -hmm. That's a no-go zone. Right. right. Um, because that's harmful to other people. Right. And if you're going around doing this or that or the other, this is harmful to people. But I think you're right. I think we are living in a time whereby everything is so completely um, misguided in mm-hmm. outrage. I think for me, the only, the only thing I think is dangerous about this time is the idea that if everything is seen as outrageous, the really outrageous things stop standing out and they stop in the trade because we're so like, Ooh, you know, someone gave me a compliment and I feel like that was sexual harassment. And it's like, 
Mm-hmm. That was a compliment, Susan. Like, take it and keep <laughs> it moving. You know, like if it, if it wasn't like physically harmful or, or like, you know, you, you felt in danger, keep it moving, girl. Take it, say thank you and move on, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I get everyone's got a different tolerance, but we cannot, we cannot police that the mm-hmm. same as a man who's really physically abusive or really, you know, harassing a woman. And so it, for me, it's like that's where we hit the danger spot, whereby, you know, the claims, if they're all seen as the same equal of importance, mm-hmm. we're in trouble. Oh, absolutely. And like I say that all the time, when you kind of move the definition of like these very dangerous things, like what is actual violence, right? Like we are now saying like, you know, speech, like speech is violence. Like some people are actually saying that. And in rare instances, like that can lead to violence, right? But the speech itself is not. So I think it's very important to have like you know, a hard definition of what these like evil and bad things are because it makes everything else like it takes away from the things that actually need our attention, right? And you can use like the sexual harassment as like a really good example. It's like there needs to be a line. So, you know, a compliment's a compliment and whether or not you appreciated it, like that's not really relevant, right? Like let's focus our attention on like things that matter where like women are actually getting like stoned to death in some countries because they've been raped. So like in our country, like I see like these feminists that are fighting for what I consider like ridiculous hills to die on. I'm like, focus your energy somewhere else, right? Like there's like, there are women that are actually being oppressed that like really need your help, your influence, like especially if you have a big audience. So I think it's like, we need to kind of really focus our energy on matters that like deserve our attention instead of like, again, wanting to be victimized in some way. And for, I feel like a lot of people that are fighting these battles and like dying on these like ridiculous hills, if you will, um, it goes back to like not wanting to look inwardly. So you focus on other people's problems because then you're not forced to face your own. And I think sometimes, you know, it's well intended, right? Like no one wants to see someone being rude to someone else or hurting someone else. And of course, if you see something wrong, do something. But at the end of the day, you also, again, you can't redefine these very fundamental words, right? It's very important for the progress of everybody that like violence remains violence. Like sexual harassment is what it is. And you don't get to like cherry pick what that means because you had a certain feeling, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think for me, the biggest um, indicator of this was when, you know, everything was getting started with the Me Too, which is such an important movement. Um, And then there was, I, I forgot who the actor was, um, but he'd gone on a bad date, pretty much. It, it really, when we summed up the evidence and the facts, um, this woman tweeted that she, he, uh, he harassed her and he's a part of me too. When we deciphered the facts, we found out that, oh, he just went on a really terrible date and she hated the fact that she slept with him. And, you know, she made a sensual decision, though, to sleep with him. It wasn't forced and coerced. Right. Um, and I was like, but just because you regret an incident does not make it harassment, right? Absolutely. And so. I think any time, I think it's much more important to focus, like you're saying, on the big topics. But I also think that in society today, it's becoming much more difficult to do so. Because I think I look at social media and I look at Twitter, like, you know, um, one of the platforms I really can't stand in many ways. Um, and I see how people get bullied almost into do, making statements, into saying things, into standing for things. And I'm like, okay. Yes, but first let's dissect what's going on here before we have these massive, outrageous statements, you know. And I think there is a reward system, though. Like, we live in a society where it's rewarded to be outraged. Yeah. Right? The angrier you are for something, it's like, yeah, you know, I got you. You get the most likes, retweets, whatever, whatever. Um, And people start painting you as like, yeah, you know, that person is so outraged. Um, and it's not, it's not cool anymore to be calm and peaceful and looking for inner peace and working on yourself. Like those things aren't cool. <laughs> you know, the anger is cool right now. So I find that dangerous. Oh, absolutely. It almost becomes like, like I remember with the Me Too movement, it like started in a good place, right? Because like I would say almost every woman I know has like had an incident, like a real incident that's happened that probably shouldn't have happened. Um, but I feel like, I mean, there's a lot of men too that they just don't come forward because everyone would laugh at them, right? Like, I mean, I've talked to men that have been sexually harassed and sexually, you know, molested by women. So it's across the board. It's a, it's a problem across the board. And then we somehow turned that into believe all women. Well, that doesn't make sense, right? Because people, 
inherently have flaws and sometimes people lie and sometimes people misconstrue whether it's intentional or not. So like you can't have that as a blanket statement. So then it turned into like, again, it goes back and it goes into like an aggressive state for some reason, like that's like our neutral. So instead of like helping women that actually need women, now it's like, well, someone, you know, grazed my shoulder the wrong way. So we're going to ruin this man's life. And because she's a woman and she said it, then we have to believe her. And like, no man's allowed to talk on the subject. Only women are allowed to have issues. So it goes back to like trying to find that unity, I guess. And like, stop saying like only certain people are allowed to have an opinion on anything. Yeah, that's a big one. I mm-hmm. think that's a big one. I think as soon as you start saying only a certain group of people can speak on certain things, you know, um, I think it becomes very dangerous because mm-hmm. then, it becomes, you know, whenever you confine speech, that's when sight, like little cells get formed, right? Because people are going to express themselves. Mm-hmm. Now the danger comes in if we unite as a group and let's say we have a hateful agenda and we have like, we are anti-woman and we are, you know, pro all these terrible things and we can't say certain things, you know, out in the public, we're going to unite. We are going to find each other mm-hmm. somewhere. People mm-hmm. always find each other. Um, and I think anytime you mute people, the anger builds up to a point where people feel like they're going to express this anyway. I think for me, it's microaggressions are more dangerous than overt aggressions for me. I think, you know, people are quick to call out the big things, the big transgressions, which I think is important if you really make a big blooper. But I think for me, like more importantly than, you know, PCing someone or policing what someone is saying is like watching people's behavior actions and belief system right like does this person are they an inclusive person are they voting correctly are they supportive of you know black rights gay rights this rights whatever are they you know you have to look at people holistically before you call them racist or sexist Mm -hmm. or whatever you have to really look at a human being and be like are they right they just hear the evidence to support it (laughs) or did they say something that alluded to and someone got offended you know, because we're not talking about, of course, the people who go out and they say really racist shit. Of course, we're speaking of course. about people who like maybe say something, either it's a slip of the tongue with, you know, they, you know, brand something and they've got a monkey or like a banana or whatever. And when they dress a child that's adopted in a banana and they're like, oh, you're calling your child a monkey. And it's like, I'm not calling. It was just a cute t-shirt that had a banana. And, I mm-hmm. put it, and he likes the banana t-shirt. Right. You know? So sometimes like, there's just like a level of ignorance too. That's just like misunderstood. And how do we get through ignorance if we're not willing to have conversations, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. Just this weird loop that society is finding itself in right now. So on an ending note, what would you say like your life mission is? Like, what do you want to kind of achieve? Oh my gosh. Um, I think for me, it's just, you know, this seems like a really big statement, but I just want to leave the world better than I found it, you know? And so for me, that has transpired as, you know, teaching people how to heal and get through resentment. But I think it doesn't have to be that for people. I think for me, it's like, you know, that smile that you give a teller or like uh, the guy at the bodega or like, you know, you walk past someone, you help them with something. I mean, it's in those small actions. It's in those small interactions when you're good to people and you're genuinely kind and you genuinely care about other people and you put your judgments on hold. I think we live in such a judgmental society that is like everything is like, oh, 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 you know. Um, and I think for me, it's just, you know, if I can pass on and people are like, oh, my gosh, my interaction with that person was amazing or they, you know, really left me in a better place or better state or whatever the case is. I think my life would feel like I did something. I did mm-hmm. something. And what's yours? I'm curious. Mine is probably pretty similar. I, I'm i finding like the most fulfillment so far from like this whole podcasting venture that I'm doing. So for me, it's to hopefully like influence people to be more curious um, and to like ask more questions and to really like discover themselves and um to kind of like try to view things with more empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it can happen on such a small level, right? Like it could just be like 10 people. And that's like, that's great. If I can make 10 people happier and like maybe like really find themselves and not be a dick, then like that's, I'm good with that. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. We, we, we're trying to just make people realize don't be a dick. Really. That's our life. That's our takeaway. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. This whole podcast could be summed up. That line in the don't be a dick. Exactly. If we can make like apparel, like merchandise it, let's do it. Exactly. We've got a business. 
Well, can you, uh, can you tell everyone where they can find more of you, how they can support you? Um, I'd love to like help you promote anything you're working on. Oh, absolutely. So everything I'm working on is on my website, www.candismama.com. Um, and my book is on there. My podcast is on there. Everything I'm doing is on there. Uh, Candice Mama is all my social media. So yeah, that's, that's it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate appreciate your time and I think your message is awesome. So everyone, please go check her out. Thank you, Candice. I've appreciated this and it's been fun. It's been great meeting you. That's it for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have the time, please rate and review and you can always hit subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. I hope to have you back. Mm -hmm.